Well, good morning. Few brave souls who persisted until we reached this point. Um, uh, I was going to try a bold experiment with you adding comments to the talk as we went on, which is why there's a URL at the top of the screen. But I can't get on the network, so <clears throat> this is a PDF. Um, so I last gave a talk here in 2011, and it looked like this. And you'll notice the title is remarkably similar to the title today. What I thought I would do is update you on all the things that have happened since 2011. Um, so let's do that. Uh, the question a lot of people ask is, is open source still relevant now the battle against Microsoft is over? Microsoft is now uh, defending itself against attackers on all fronts. Uh, it has adopted open source which means that in all the areas where it's failing, it's desperately trying to use open source to make friends amongst all the people that it spent two decades alienating. Uh, and uh, so that's the question. Now, I'd suggest to you that there are a lot more predators in the water than Microsoft. They are not the only reptile in the swamp. And uh, I think that that question is the wrong question. That was never the battle. The open source movement was never fighting Microsoft. The open source movement was instead just doing its own thing. And some businesses um, decided they, they would annex it to try and fight Microsoft. And um, I think something else has been going on because, you know, since 1998, open source has changed from being dangerous to being, in 2015, the default for business. In 2015, we have found that 78% of businesses are operating using open source software. There's 55% of those businesses say that they, for them, in their experience, open source is more secure than proprietary software. Now, I would like to ask them some questions about that, because I think there's probably a deeper truth to be discovered. But it, it is true that when you find a security defect in open source, you can fix it. Whereas when you find a, a security defect in proprietary software, uh, you have no idea whether it has ever been fixed. And so I would rather use uh, open source software for that reason. 88%, this is the significant number, 88% of the businesses that are using open source, which you'll remember is 77% of them, 88% say they will contribute to open source within the next three years. And this is very significant. We're seeing business use of open source shift from being consumption, from being the avoidance of license fees, from being a response to Microsoft or Oracle or SAP, to becoming a key part of the strategy where people are willing to contribute to the projects that they depend on. That is a profound change in the way that open source is working. The rules have changed, and uh, it's no longer the case that your previous assumptions are correct. Now, in 2011, I talked about software freedom in the context of open source being on the verge of being the big thing. In 2015, I'm speaking to you in the context that open source is now everywhere. It's in more everywhere than you can imagine. Uh, it is the software that is running the Apple Store. It is the software behind iTunes. It is software that's used widely in Azure. It is software that's used in every city's information systems behind the scenes. It is the software that is driving the majority of desktop applications. Now, before you worry about that statement, many people are now using web-based solutions for their desktop applications. And the majority of those are running on Linux at the server. And that means that window on your desktop where you're using Google Docs is actually open source on the desktop. We've been waiting for the year of the Linux desktop, and it came and is here, and we didn't even notice. So is open source still relevant now that Microsoft is no longer the enemy? Hell yes. So how is it relevant? We've got to understand how it's relevant. And to do that, we need to go back to the origins of open source. Um, you may, I don't know which of these gentlemen you recognize. Maybe you recognize both of them. Um, the gentleman uh, in the blue sweater is Bill Joy. And the gentleman in the red shirt is Richard Stallman. And both of them 
were working at around about the same time on the different coasts of the US, fundamentally creating what we would now call the free and open source software movement. Uh, there's a tendency to forget about Bill Joy because Richard Stallman is, is so notorious, so uh, vocal on, on issues, but Bill did a, a, a profound thing by creating BSD Unix and by creating the BSD license that goes with it. And if anything, it was his software that meant that open source was running on all the world's computers before uh, Linus Torvalds had even started on his kernel. Um, so these two gentlemen both worked on open source. Uh, well, Richard wouldn't appreciate me saying that. Um, uh, Bill Joy's attitude towards open source was, look, um, I'm doing stuff. I think my stuff is great. I think you will think my stuff is great. I want you to use it. So you've got my permission to use my software for anything you like. Just don't claim that you're me and don't bother me. And that sums up, that's the BSD license. That's a little longer than the BSD license, actually, because the BSD license says that more succinctly. And, and that attitude towards free and open source software is the, was the fundamental attitude towards free and open source software for decades. That was the attitude towards software before companies started locking it up. The way we all thought of software was it's, it's this stuff that you can use and change, and you fix it if it's broken. Now, Richard Stallman came along, and he did something different, because he was prevented from fixing his own software. And after a run-in with um, a, actually one of Bill Joy's colleagues, um, uh, Richard Stallman had a run-in with um, uh, James Gosling, the creator of Java. Uh, at that time, James Gosling was a postgraduate student maintaining the, uh, the Emacs libraries. And uh, uh, James found that he didn't have enough time to both get his PhD and maintain the Emacs libraries. And so one of his buddies dropped out of college to distribute the Emacs libraries. And um, uh, James sold him the collective copyright to the library. And Richard discovered that he could not freely copy the Emacs libraries anymore because the copyright belonged to this guy that was copying tapes. And so Richard created the GNU General Public License uh, as the response to that run-in with James Gosling. I don't know if you realize that the wires all join that actually Java and James Gosling and the GPL are all kind of twisted together somewhere. It's interesting to hear them both tell the story. They said they tell it quite differently. <laughs> so uh, Richard Stallman um, came up with a great set of ideas. He came up with the, uh, some principles for what makes software free. And he insists on using the word free, despite it being a really bad idea for people with English as a first language, who invariably think of money when you say free. But nonetheless, he talks about free software. And he says that the free software is software that you can use for any purpose, that you're free to study, that you're free to improve, and that you're free to share in both its original and improved form with anyone you wish. And those four freedoms lie at the heart of free software and open source. Now, it may shock you to know that, um, so I was the president of OSI for three years. I'm still on the OSI board. I believe passionately in software freedom because that is what open source is all about. Open source is just a way of talking about software freedom that doesn't piss people off. And so uh, these are fundamental to open source. Uh, the open source definition is a longer way of saying the same thing. And it's very important because it allows you to objectively determine whether a piece of software is actually free software. If you look at the, the way that the Free Software Foundation looks at things, you can't objectively know whether any software is free software, because you have to discuss whether it is delivered as free software under a free software license. But OSI says it's only free software, it's only open source software, if it's under a license that the community has previously agreed and endorsed as complying with these 10 principles. And OSI has run a process now for uh, 14 years, successfully applying those principles to licenses. And you can be sure that a piece of software is software that comes with the four freedoms if it's under an OSI approved license. And that is what's revolutionized open source in the business world because it means you no longer have to go and get a lawyer every time you get a piece of code. As long as your business is suitably enlightened, your business can tell you that open source software is okay and that you are welcome to develop it for our internal use. And you haven't got to go and get the general counsel to approve the license every time because OSI has already done that.
That works pretty well. People created a whole load of FUD around the GPL, and uh, companies like Black Duck managed to create an industry out of scaring people into needing audit and believing that uh, software needs to have compliance. You only need to do compliance testing of your software if you're going to ship it to somebody else. If you're going to use it internally, you don't need to do that. So all that compliance stuff is all very um, unnecessary FUD in my view. And uh, I suggest whenever you hear the word open source compliance, that you get people to justify their use of the phrase, because generally they're trying to scare you into buying their scanner. Open source is inherently permissionless software. Actually, what, what I really mean is open source software is inherently software where you have permission in advance to do whatever you wish with it. So open source software is software where you don't have to ask anyone's permission in order to innovate. You can remove your own obstacles. You don't have to ask somebody else for permission to proceed. And that is the key characteristic of open source software. It is permissionless software. You can innovate freely. You can solve your own problems. You don't need anybody else to do that for you. That's kind of worrying. OK. Um, now, I, I sum all that up with the phrase flexibility, because I've found that if I talk about software freedom, people think that I'm some kind of a, a, a campaigning socialist, particularly in America, uh, where, of course, uh, freedom is something that only comes if you take it away from people. Um, So I, I found talking about software freedom isn't very useful. I found that talking about free software isn't a very good thing to do if you have an audience of people who have English as a first language. Uh, a, a, a researcher called George Lakoff explained why that was. He explains that you create linguistic frames and that when you use words from a particular linguistic frame, the rest of the words that go with that linguistic frame come with it. So when you decide, when you're talking about someone who is ill, and you just say that they are struggling with their illness. You have invoked a battle, a war frame, a fighting frame. And the rest of the language you use to talk about that illness will probably be about fighting. It'll be about struggling. It'll be about, and, and, and when they eventually die, you'll have to say they failed because they lost. And by invoking the frame, you get the rest of the words and vocabulary that comes with it. And when you use the word free in English, you inevitably invoke a price frame. You cannot do anything else. People immediately think of price. And you spend the rest of the discussion trying to explain how, no, 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 you didn't mean price. Free as in beer, which has never been very free as far as I've been concerned. So I suggest not using the word free, not because I dislike Richard. I think I admire him greatly. But because I think that for people, if you're speaking to an English-speaking audience, the word flexibility also starts with an F. So you can still use an F in uh, abbreviations like FOSDEM. Doesn't work with FROSCON, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, flexibility conveys the same meaning. It conveys the idea of being able to do what you wish, to work around problems, being able to uh, proceed without seeking additional permission. Uh, now, the reason I say that is because I think that free and open source software is fundamental to the future of technology. I think all the new technologies that we're caring about are only possible with open source software. You can't do it without. Now, think of cloud computing. If you try and do cloud computing in a world that requires that you ask permission every time you deploy a new instance, that is to say a world of proprietary licensing, you will only ever be able to work with one vendor. Because you will only be able to work with the vendor who can waive the requirement that you seek a license every time you run another instance. So if you go for Microsoft Azure, or for, what's IBM? IBM's got a, a, a Bluemix. If you go for IBM Bluemix, if you go for a, a proprietary solution, you will never be able to buy from anybody else. Because the only people who can waive the requirement to take a license are the people who run that cloud. Uh, cloud portability is just not going to happen. Unless, by cloud, what you mean is using the platform to run a copy of Linux and then running your apps inside Linux. But hey, look, that's open source software. You may as well use a world where it's open source. Because open source, you'll remember, you can use for any purpose without additional permission. And so in the world of cloud, using open source software means being able to scale. It means being able to respond to demand. It means being able to blend solutions together to produce the best solution for your problem. And so cloud computing utterly depends for scaling and for full deployment on open source. There's no surprise that open source software is what lies underneath Amazon's software. It's what lies underneath Google's software. 
It's no surprise that a company like Facebook utterly depends on open source software. It's because you need that flexibility. Similarly, Internet of Things. Internet of Things is really scary if you use proprietary software in your devices because you suddenly have to worry about where they are, make sure they haven't crossed any borders into territories where, where there's maybe a problem with that license. You've also got to count how many of them there are because you've got to make sure you've paid all your license fees. You've also got to make sure that the license terms blend and that uh, that proprietary license and the licenses for the other things in there are all compatible with each other. It's a nightmare. If you want to do Internet of Things, you need permissionless device firmware. Because as soon as you do that, you don't have to worry about the software anymore. You don't have to check the licensing on your wristband, on the, the sensor in your drone, or in the, the bug that the NSA has put in your car. It, it's, it's all completely without the need to seek additional permission. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to software, we think of all these new technologies like cloud or as Internet of Things as being a bright beacon shining into the future, but you have to remember that the light that they are projecting isn't coming from them, it's coming from open source behind. Uh, so, the reason I'm telling you all these things is there is a fundamental truth here, it's that those four freedoms are fundamental to business value. If you're going to try and run a business in the uh, 21st century, you've got to have open source software. And that's not because it's a, an ethical imperative. That's not because uh, it's the right thing to do. It's not because you're a good person. All of those are hopefully true. But it's because it makes the business succeed. It means you can use the software for any purpose. That means you can prototype. You can prototype and iterate. You can fail early. You can change readily. You can use agile methods. Um, you can also do other things. You can give your employees the software to use anywhere they want to without falling afoul of, your of the licensing. It means you can run your data center without having to do license management or worry about whether Oracle is going to drop around and audit how many cores you're using this week. It means you don't have to worry about the knock on the door from if you're in the, U the US from the Business Software Alliance, checking that you've got all of your Microsoft licenses. Being able to use the software for any purpose is a key to your business value. Being able to study the software, maybe you don't want to, but it means you can hire experts freely. No one is controlling the market in skills. It means your in-house expertise can rise to any level, dependent only on the quality of the people that you're hiring and the training that you're doing. It means that for your mission-critical systems, you can have intimate understanding of the product in-house and not be dependent on a supplier who may change strategy. Being able to improve the software. Maybe you don't want to change the code, but you do want to operate in a rich marketplace with lots of add-ons, with lots of suppliers, with lots of sources of support, with no barriers to innovation, without the need for the next innovative company that comes along to first have a licensing relationship with the platform provider. Uh, everybody you see that is out there spending money marketing their Microsoft solutions, the reason they're marketing it so heavily is they borrowed a whole load of venture capital in order to become a Microsoft solution provider. And so uh, the VC who is supporting them wants them to promote themselves before they're ready because they want their money back. Uh, if you've got open source solutions, there is much more a continuum of how software can be developed because anybody can improve the software and uh, anybody can maintain it. And you have built-in escrow. Last time I was here, I worked for a company called uh, Forge Rock. Forge Rock um, was built on the software that I open sourced when I was the chief open source officer at Sun Microsystems. We open sourced all of Sun's identity middleware and uh, a very, very big information systems company, uh, the, the starts with an R, I'll let you work out who it is, uh, was dependent on our um, uh, identity management system. They had integrated maybe 300 different lines of business under single sign-on. And about the day they said they were going to go live, Oracle bought Sun and discontinued the identity manager after they'd spent three years completely transforming their business to use it. And fortunately for them, when Oracle dropped around and said, oh, by the way, uh, we'd like you to migrate to that one you didn't pick three years ago. And oh, by the way, it costs double. And oh, by the way, we've laid off all the people who are working on the one you're using. Uh, this company was able to contact us at Forge Rock, and we had simply set up a business to carry on development and carry on support of this identity manager. And so the information systems company was able to carry on without a skipped heartbeat 
into their deployment and into full production. Now, that's called uh, open source escrow. That is a free benefit you get from using open source. If you've got the money or if the market exists, somebody will step in to take over development and support of a piece of software when a vendor changes direction. That's why it's really important to make sure that the software that you get delivers software freedom to you. Uh, delivering software freedom to your supplier is less important. Uh, so if your supplier is getting open source software and they have lots of software freedom, that's great. That means they have a low cost route to market. But if you're getting software freedom, that means you're getting that built in escrow. And finally, sharing the software means you can deploy without barriers. That means you can take on service providers and not worry about whether the service provider is licensed to run the software on their cloud in, uh, infrastructure. You can uh, engage partner ecosystems. You can let the partner software and your software be the same software without having to worry about whether your partner is licensed to use the software or whether they can afford to buy licenses to it. Uh, if you're part of a government, your citizens can use your software. If you standardize on open document format, you no longer have to tell your citizens that to communicate with the government, they need to buy a piece of software from a particular proprietary vendor. Because there are many solutions that use open document format, and most of them are open source, all but one, in fact. So I'd suggest to you that uh, business value is a derivative of software freedom. Those four freedoms are the thing that, when combined together with your skill and intelligence, become the roots of business value. Um, they, they are the reason why a, a CIO or a CTO can be re-empowered. They can be given control back of their budget long term. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you are your, the uh, chief information officer or uh, chief technology officer for a company, your suppliers are constantly coming around asking for more money. They want an annual support fee. Often, your license to the software is contingent on you paying the annual support fee. And once you are using a piece of proprietary software, you no longer have negotiating power over price. When uh, the company, naming no companies, drops in after three years, which is typically how long your enterprise support agreement will have lasted in the, when you initially bought it, they will drop in and they'll tell you that they've added a 30% increase onto the license fee. And they'll tell you that they want, you to, they want to lock you in for another three years. And you won't be able to say no, because what are you going to do? Take the software out? What are you going to do? Go to another support provider illegally? Did you see what happened to SAP when they did that with Oracle? So no, uh, a CIO likes open source because a CIO is re-empowered to control the budget. They're also re-empowered to control the overall architecture. When Oracle dropped in to come and ask the company that I mentioned to uh, use their software instead, that was actually someone coming in and saying, your architecture's wrong. You shouldn't be using Sun's enterprise identity management. We think you should be using Oracle enterprise identity management. And uh, our Oracle thought that customers had no control over their architecture. But open source gave them control over their architecture. It meant they didn't have to make a decision to use something that didn't fit their business, simply because a supplier said so. Uh, developers are energized by open source. They have more options from more sources. They're able to build the software the way that it needs to be built to solve the problem. They are not in fear of having incorrectly licensed something and having to throw it away after the pilot. They're able to do, create software that correctly fits the business and that responds to business needs. And both of those um, depend on you having suppliers who are committed to giving you software freedom. Not suppliers that are committed to consuming software freedom and then charging you for proprietary access to what they built, but rather suppliers who give you the software freedom. So the principles that underlie this uh, business value are that flexibility is the origin and the way to talk about business value. And I'd suggest to you that open source flexibility should be a part of your principles of business in the same way that you might say that, oh, our development shop uses um, Agile, or our, Agile, our, our development shop uses Scrum. It's OK to use a word like that. It's describing something much more complex. It's describing something that not very many people fully understand, apart from maybe its practitioners. But it's OK in your strategy to say that that is how you're going to run your development shop. And I suggest that you need a similar principle around software freedom. You need to say, we select software 
uh, for its software freedom characteristics, or we prefer software that has open source flexibility. If you say that in your operating rules for your company, you'll then buy open source and you'll then get this business value. And so I strongly suggest that you look at ways of doing that, to write those into your procurement guidelines, to write that into your rules of operation for your IT department, so that by default you pick open source. That is what Facebook has done. That is what Google has done. Why are you going to do something better? You've got to remember that, um, that commerce and freedom are two different things, even if the dock cranes of New Jersey are trying very hard to adopt the same posture as the Statue of Liberty, uh, that freedom and commerce are not the same thing, and you have to prefer freedom first. If you don't prefer freedom first, you'll run into problems. If you focus on flexibility, you'll make cost savings. You'll make the cost savings because you're putting control of your budget and your architecture, and you're left able to negotiate with your suppliers. If you focus on savings, you'll get trapped. Because proprietary software is always cheaper to buy. That's because proprietary software knows it can charge you what it didn't charge you this year, next year. Because you're not going anywhere. So if you focus on cost savings, on cost cutting, I guarantee you you'll come astray. And I think there are some great examples in German public administrations that show you that that is true. Thinking particularly of Freiburg here, but maybe a few others. You know, I think if we didn't know better, we'd actually pay extra for open source software. Think about it. You're going to buy some software, and I'm telling you that, no, you can't use it wherever you want to. Well, surely I should pay less for that. No, you can't hire freely from people who've studied the software. Well, shouldn't I pay less? No, no, you, you, you can't change it. No, no, you can't change it. Well, shouldn't I pay less? No, if you do change it, you can't put the code back in the product again. I'm sorry. Oh, I've got to pay less for that. Why would you pay more for software that you can't use anywhere, that you can't study, that you can't change, that you can't join a collaborative community of developers to work on? Why would it cost more? I've never understood why we expect open source to cost less. Oh, it's that word free, isn't it? I remember. So let's talk about community for a bit. Communities are groups of, of uh, individuals who've all got their own self-interests. They're all independent from one another. They have no overlapping commitments. They're not uh, partners. They're not licensees. They're not part of a single ecosystem. They're all independent from each other. But they find in the open source software, that's the green circle there, something that is of value to their business. And they come in and collaborate to create that open source software. That's the, the core of open source. It is about uh, independent, unrelated entities, people, companies, coming together to collaborate. And if you're going to do that, you need to set some ground rules for how people are going to come together. You need to make sure it's safe to come together and collaborate. And that is what open source licensing is about. Open source licenses are not licenses the way that a business lawyer thinks about licenses. They are actual, actually, well, so if you're, if you're talking to a lawyer, a license is a bilateral agreement. It's two parties making a truce, declaring where they will not fight, declaring where it is safe to be friends, often for the exchange of money. And uh, open source licenses are not like that. Open source licenses are multilateral. They are the collection of permissions that are needed to make sure that you can come to the open source project with permission to do everything that you want to without needing to have a relationship with anybody else. So open source licenses are not best understood as, as a legal agreement. They're better understood as a consensus or a constitution for the permissions and norms of a community. And this is why open source licenses are so important. This is why OSI focused on them, is because once you have got an o a license that guarantees that you have permission in advance to do the things that a particular community thinks are normal, then you can proceed freely into innovation. Uh, open source licenses are crucial. This, by the way, is why it's a really bad idea to try and find ways to work around the GPL. Because the reason that communities use the GPL 
is because the GPL is the, the, the best fit of a multilateral consensus between the community participants. And when you, maybe you're a company like, oh, I don't know, VMware, and you think that you're, that you're really smart people and that you should be allowed to do whatever you wish in connection with the community, well, you know, you should really ask the community what its norms are. And that particular community for the uh, Linux kernel has got a norm that if you want to use the Linux kernel for any purpose, you're free to do so. But if you give it to other people, you have to make sure they have the same freedoms you've got. That's what the GPL says. And if you decide you're going to frustrate that activity, you're trying to frustrate a community. It isn't a matter of law. It's just a, a straightforward matter of decency. It's quite unlikely that any community is going to be able to pursue you to death, although I think actually the Software Freedom Law Center is going to do its best in the case of VMware. But it is just a simple matter of decency. You don't go to a community and tell them that you disagree with their norms, but you're still going to take their stuff anyway. So a summary of that section for you. Software freedom, it's key to your future. It's the origin of business value in the 21st century when it comes to software. You're not going to succeed without open source software in any of the lines of business that involve software that I can see coming up on the horizon anywhere. Cloud, devices, shared data, open government. It's all going to need open source software. The origin of the freedom that gives that business value is the four freedoms. And those are actually the basis of trust for a shared community. Um, so if you're going to think about open source, you have to think about the license as the thing that gives you permission. But you also have to think of the license as the set of permissions for the community you're going to work with. OK. I'm going to talk to you briefly about OSI, because I talked about that in 2011. Um, uh, OSI was formed in 1998. Um, it was uh, created by a group of people who were meeting in a, a, an office in Silicon Valley who were very worried about this problem of the word free making businesses think the wrong thing when it came to open source software. And they were also very worried by the tendency of evangelists of open source software or free software to lead with ethics. Because unfortunately, businesses don't do ethics. People do ethics. Business do balance sheets. So if you try and talk to a business in terms of ethics, you'll often get a kind of a, imagine a dog hearing a strange noise. They don't really know what you're talking about. And so all of the attempts to promote free software in business were hampered by an, an intense desire to talk about ethics to people who didn't give a damn about ethics. And so OSI was formed, the term open source was coined at the same meeting, so that there was another way of talking about software freedom that didn't involve leading with ethics. Didn't mean there was no ethics involved, because there were still people involved, and people have ethics. And all the people who were doing this work all had ethics and supported software freedom. But they wanted this next revolution to start. So uh, since then, OSI has focused mainly on licensing. It's had a license review process that has been approving open source licenses as things that promote software freedom. And um, we decided that that wasn't enough. Uh, we got to a position, let's go back a slide. Ah. We got to a position um, uh, six years ago where we realized that OSI needed, it was a solved, licensing was a solved problem now. We've got a perfectly good license review process. It gives, you go through hell if you apply to uh, have an OSI approved license now. There's, we've got a couple of people who are on the license review list at the moment, scratching their heads, wondering why we haven't approved their license yet, simply not understanding that we don't want to approve their license. And we're probably going to wait until they go away. We'll keep on talking, but eventually they're going to go away. Um, so we, we, that's, that's not enough. Now, if we stop having an OSI, somebody else will come along and claim to be the licensing standardization authority for open source licenses. And all the candidates of well-funded organizations to do that are ones we don't want managing the process. Because they will all say that open source licenses don't have to have the four freedoms. Um, that's not just supposition. I, I have met these people. They would very much like a little bit more flexibility in what constitutes an open source license. They would particularly like to not give permission in advance to do things that are commercial. 
Um, so we decided that if OSI was going to carry on playing that role, we needed to give it another purpose. And we looked in our charter and we discovered that, oh, we have a, some sort of thing about community building in our charter. Turns out, if you look at our bylaws, that's our first, first priority. So we said, how can we do that? OSI, since I spoke to you in 2011, has become a member organization. We now have approaching 500 personal individual members. We've also got approaching 50 uh, affiliate nonprofit organizations. And we, are, uh, we now have approaching, uh, I think we're actually over 10 uh, commercial sponsors. Uh, we've been able to hire a, a general manager to work full time on the organization. We've been able to uh, engage in a number of useful activities, um, such as helping uh, uh, open hatch. Um, uh, introduce new people to open source. We've created a curriculum for open source for uh, MBA students. So that if you're doing an MBA, you can ask your professor to teach you open source as well. So we have the curriculum for it. Uh, and that all came through our incubator process. The incubator process is a way that you can ask OSI to spend money on your behalf. Kind of sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, so we've gone from being this board of directors here. This was the board bef just before I joined OSI. I took the photograph because they didn't want me in it. <laughs> and we've gone to focusing on community. And um, uh, what the incubator process does is it asks you to propose some, some new activity you think is going to promote open source and software freedom. Now, we don't want it to be about code. Plenty of places to go start new code projects. Go to Apache. Go to Software Freedom Conservancy. Go somewhere else. But if you want to start something which promotes open source, that is a meta open source project, then we're here for you. If you want to start a, a new newsletter for a particular demographic that's poorly served in open source, if you want to create a travel fund for a particular demographic to go to conferences, if you would like to uh, campaign in parliament in some country around a bad law that is going to prevent open source from succeeding, those are all the sorts of things that OSI's incubator process is there for. And what we'd like you to do is make a proposal. Your proposal is going to be concrete. I'll show you in a moment. Uh, you'll get a green light from the board. who will say, yes, that's a great idea. Uh, you'll then use OSI's resources to build the thing that you said you were going to deliver. And on the date that you agreed to deliver it, the board will review it. And as long as it does the thing you said you were going to do, they will approve it. And uh, when you approve it, it becomes a part of OSI's permanent mission. So we will make sure we, that we staff it and that we keep it going, if that's what your, the thing you made does. In your proposal, what you're going to say is you're going to say, what is the thing you're going to make? You're going to say, um, we're going to have a new set of web pages for the OSI website that has links to licensed translations into German. Uh, you're going to say, who's going to make it? I and my three friends are going to make the set of web pages. Uh, what OSI resources will that take? We'll need login IDs for your content management system. And we will need the home phone number of your system administrator. And we will need 100 euros so that we can all meet in a restaurant twice to talk about what we're doing. And when will you make the delivery? We'll have these web pages ready for you by the beginning of December. So that's your proposal. It's concrete. It's time bounded. It specifies the resources that you need. And um, once you have done this thing, we will then make it part of OSI. So we're actively seeking proposals now for new things that make open source better. And if you've got a proposal, then please uh, drop by our website, opensource.org, or contact me and I will help you. So there we go. Look at that. Um, so here's a summary for you. Software freedom is the key to open source value. Uh, we've kind of forgotten about it uh, if in the open source world in some places. I attend conferences like uh, OSCON, which is like FrostCon, but without the free. Um, and uh, really, they've kind of forgotten software freedom there. They don't really talk about it. Uh, they talk a lot about business and a lot about innovation. They've forgotten that all of that value that they're talking about depends on software freedom. Software freedom is the key to open source value. It delivers permission in advance for you to innovate, succeed, and create value through OSI-approved licenses. The OSI-approved license is the thing that means you don't have to get into debate with me or with Richard Stallman or with anybody else 
about whether that thing you're doing is actually free software. Um, without the OSI approved license, you're probably going to have that discussion. And I'll tell you now, you're not going to enjoy it. Um, and then OSI has transformed into an organization that wants to support you in making open source better. And I encourage you to join OSI. It costs 40 US dollars. Or if you send a begging letter to our general manager, he will give you a free membership. Uh, it's got to be a really good begging letter, though, explaining why you're begging. Uh, and uh, we would love to have you join and to bring your new ideas to us. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. I'm supposed to advertise my, I, my current employer is an Indian systems integrator called Wipro, who we are trying to convert into an open source organization. If we succeed, that's $6 billion extra investment for open source. And if we fail, then I'm looking for a job. Uh, and with that, I would love to take any questions that you've got and possibly answer them. And we have... Yeah. <laughs> And we have seven minutes. Yeah, I'm allowed to give you five minutes more because of, of the technical That's issues. Right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working the time here. That's yeah, I, 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 it was I, great. I, I, I need my fizzy mate outside. Anyway. <laughs> so well, yes. So any questions, please? Yes. yes. I come to you. Oh, thanks for the microphone. Hello. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I wondered about the a phase where you said like. Um, while I see this point you were trying to make with Black Duck and license compliance and all these things, and uh, that they want to scare you and uh, the story. And then you came to another point in your talk where it talked about like this decency of respecting the license of the authors. But isn't this issue of license compliance just another word for the companies trying to try to respect the licensing of the authors? Um, well, it could be, but in, pr in practice it isn't. Because, because the reason that, the reason that uh, an embedded device manufacturer, for example, is doing license compliance is so that they don't have to ever engage with the community. So the, the, the VMware really isn't interested in being a part of any open source. While, while I don't know for VMware, I've learned that the largest Linux kernel contributors are actually from companies. Oh, they are, but that's a different matter. So, they, okay. <laughs> so the, the very largest Linux kernel contributors are, 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 you know, there's a lot of people from Microsoft who are Linux kernel contributors. For their drivers, okay. And what they're doing, <laughs> what they're doing is to, they want their drivers in the kernel yeah. so, so, so that Azure works properly. And IBM is a huge contributor, and that's because they've got a whole load of hardware and they want Linux to run on it. And so those, those companies are significant contributors. Now, IBM is an interesting case. IBM dislikes the GPL profoundly. And you'll find that if you ever suggest using a copyleft license in software at IBM, you, you, it is absolutely forbidden. Um, because their, their, their license compliance process means they don't want to get anywhere near any of those things that will force them to have a relationship with the community. So uh, it, it is, you could frame it as the uh, license compliance process as being um, you know, how to be good to the community. What it actually is, is making sure that you can avoid having to have this one. Well, um, I, I'm not sure that that actually is uh, valid for all of the companies, <laughs> because <laughs> I work for a company. Yeah. And I can tell you, the company I'm working for is really pushing hard embedded board developers and system on chip developers to put their things into the Linux kernel. Because if you're a company like a systems integrator, you have a big pain Absolutely. of actually downloading Linux kernel, then patching it with the stuff from Atmel or Texas Instruments and all these kinds of yep. things. And then if there is a kernel update, you need to go back to the vendors and ask them what's about your update. So as a systems integrator company, we, we see license compliance also to our suppliers to tell them, look, your stuff, if you want to sell us things, they need to be in the Linux kernel, and I think that's also a way of how companies right. deal with license compliance. So, uh, so two, two, maybe three things on that. Um, uh, one of them, I, I'm dealing with other companies. So at my, in my current job, I'm dealing with people like big utility companies, big uh, public administrations, uh, and they are being told that license compliance is something they have to do. They don't ship code to anybody, but they're being told that the GPL is very scary, that the GPL, the GPL will mess up their IT systems, that they should stay away from the GPL, and that they should buy a scanner so that they don't have, don't have any GPL in their company. Actually, you can have an open source scanner. Did you, you know can. it? I do. I, there, are, <laughs> there are at least two of them. Okay. Um, uh, so that, that, that's one point. Um, what you're saying, however, is what I found at Sun, 
was that the GPL is just another license. And I already have lots of licenses in my development process. I'm buying them from Wind River. I'm buying them from, from other third party suppliers. Each of those licenses is itself something I have to comply with. And so as, a, as somebody who's shipping product outside the company, I have a compliance process already. And actually, the GPL is a really good license because it's the same everywhere. I don't have to re-evaluate re it every time I bring new software in. And uh, I, to, to those, those exceptions create extra freedoms. So if I'm happy to live with the GPL in my business and to manage compliance for it, then it's just like dealing with a piece of proprietary software, really. It has some requirements. So I found at Sun that once we got our head past the GPL is scary and evil and, we, and we've got to avoid it, and started thinking about the GPL as just another license that's going through our compliance process, suddenly everything became easy. Uh, and then finally, what you're describing there is, the, is really the power of open source. It is that you can contribute back. Um, when you contribute back, your costs go down. And uh, the reason your costs go down is you're no longer responsible for maintaining a private fork of the code. And that, that's, that's an insight a lot of people haven't gained yet. That, Contributing back is actually something that you do to reduce your costs, not something that you do to increase your costs. Do we have another question? Okay, there. Let you one at the back up there. So. Um, Current uh, open source software license is all about software, but we see increasingly like digital hardware, FPGAs being integrated, like Intel buying Altera, things like that. So I have a, still a hard time finding a license that um, applies better to this digital hardware. So hardware not meaning like maker community, like stuff you saw yeah. out of wood or so, but digital hardware. What would you suggest, especially in a terms of a copyleft license? So the permissive license can be used pretty well, the copyleft licenses are kind of a harder topic because especially in a system like an FPGA, you don't have a full system where you can have full freedom of the whole system. You integrate cores from vendors like Xilinx or Altera, which are closed source and remain closed source. So what's the license things here and is uh, OSI trying to kind of extend its uh, coverage towards those types of software configuration? <clears throat> so w we had specific requests to uh, move into open hardware licensing, particularly in relation to the maker community. And we decided we would not do that because, first of all, there is another organization called OSHWA, Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, secondly, because, um, I, so I've actually done this. I, I open sourced the Spark chip. So one of the things we open sourced at some was the design of the Spark chip. You can, you, I don't know whether Oracle has left the website up. I bet they haven't. But uh, we released the full um, uh, Verilog source, we released the full tool chain, and we released the full test suite for Spark under the GPLv2. And uh, we felt that was the ideal license for it, because you have to re reimagine what the license terms of the GPLv2 mean in that world. Um, Generally, we found that, uh, so we saw our Spark code being used by, I think, three different vendors. They were, they were all Chinese, interestingly. Um, they, they, we, saw, we saw one company that was making a, uh, they, they found an FPGA big enough to burn a single Spark core into, and they made one of those. And we saw, we saw another company build a two-core Spark chip that they did using conventional fabrication. Uh, and we found that um, the GPL's requirements were very easy to satisfy for them because uh, all they had to do was to make sure that there was a pointer to the full corresponding source of what was in the, in the chip. Um, now, if you want copyleft in your chip designs, I think that that, that, that approach is a, an adequate one. I'm not aware of anybody else who has tried to do copyleft in, in silicon or electronic designs. Uh, the people there, now my friend Andrew Katz in the UK has recently been working on a license that is a, uh, a, a Mozilla public license strength, so a, 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 um, a, uh, a file-based copyleft license. And I could put you in contact with Andrew because he, he and some other people have been working on a, a new licensing direction, but they haven't got as far as thinking that it's safe to put into production yet, I don't think.
I think, uh, yes, the time is up. Um, yep. If there's another question, I think uh, Simon Phipps will be available I'll be outside. Out, I'll be outside for at least half an hour. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then I will be eating meat and sausages this evening. <laughs> okay, so I think you can give him a nice applause because it was a quite visionary talk, I think. Thank you.